All right, we're going to show you the bone assemblies that you have to know in the upcoming weeks, starting with the one that includes the scapula, the clavicle, and the humerus. This is your scapula, this is the anterior side, and this is the posterior side. Notice the posterior side can be distinguished because it has a spine. Just think the spine goes in the back. And notice that it feeds into a structure called the acromion. Now you know that this is the left scapula because when this is toward the back, and the acromion is lateral. That makes this a left scapula. The acromion, not to be confused with the coracoid process, is where the clavicle is going to articulate. So when you look at a clavicle, as we have here, there's a thin acromial region and there's a thicker sternal or medial region. No surprise, the acromial end articulates with the acromion of the scapula. Make sure that little conoid process is downward. When they articulate properly, you'll see the acromial end of the clavicle match up with the acromion of the scapula. And notice also that the clavicle is bowing outward as it approaches the sternal end. The final touch in this bone assembly is to match up the humerus. This is the head of the humerus with the scapula. There's a glenoid cavity in the scapula that very nicely accommodates the head of that humerus, and so you want to put them together like this. Okay, the next bone assembly we're going to do is the humerus together with the radius and the ulna, and I'm showing you here a left humerus. A couple of the bone markings that you need to be very familiar with in order to do this bone assembly correctly is notice the medial, mount, the medial epicondyle defines this as being a left humerus because the medial epicondyle is pointing medially as is the head. And there are two bone markings down here, the trochlea and the capitulum, which are important in this bone assembly. Here you're looking at a left radius. Notice that the radius has a styloid process and a smooth face right here. It does have a bumpy face on the posterior side, but in anatomical position, this is the side that you'll be seeing. Notice also that the radius has a very noticeable round head at the other end, at the proximal end. Finally, we have the ulna. The ulna has a styloid process as well. It's much smaller. At the more proximal end of the ulna, you'll see something called a trochlear notch, a very noticeable uh, indentation here, and something called a radial notch that looks a little bit like a thumbprint. When these bones are all articulated together properly, uh, they're seen best when we look at them on an actual human subject. Okay, so when we actually articulate these three bones together, there are a couple things you want to look for. We mentioned before this is called the capitulum on the humerus. If you abbreviate that to cap, just think the cap goes on the head of the radius. So the bones articulate that way. And then we mentioned this is called the trochlea, and this is the trochlear notch on the ulna. So the trochlea of the humerus goes into the trochlear notch of the ulna. Now if we look down here, the other thing you want to look for is the positioning of the styloid processes in relation to the hand. The radial styloid process looks like a thumb and that matches the thumb of the subject. And the styloid process of the ulna looks like a pinky, which matches the pinky of the, of the subject. When these, two, when these two styloid processes are in perfect position, they form what look like goalposts. And in the next segment, we'll show you how the hand fits right in between those two goalposts. Okay, this is our third bone assembly, and it's kind of a continuation of the one we just did. Here you can see the left radius and the left ulna. Each of these two bones has a styloid process. Here's the radial styloid process and the ulnar styloid process. These, arms are, these arm bones are assembled in anatomical position, so you're looking at the anterior aspect of these bones. Notice how those two styloid processes form kind of like goalposts. And if you correctly position the hand, the left hand in between those goalposts, this is a, a correct bone assembly. So a left hand with a left forearm. 
The next bone assembly we're going to do is the femur together with the tibia and fibula. So again, the most important thing you can do is make sure you're all from the same side of the body. We're going to look at left sides here. When you look at the femur, the head of the femur has to be pointing medially, and you want to make sure that the trochanters are toward the back. Those are posterior structures. So in this case, we do have a left femur. I'm going to slide it down here and show you a couple of structures on the distal end of the femur. You can see there are two very prominent condyles. And then on the um, lateral surface here, you can see a lateral epicondyle. The condyles are the part that are going to articulate with the tibia. So let's bring the tibia into the picture here. The tibia has two articular facets that you can see here into which these condyles of the femur are going to fit. So when this bone assembly is done correctly, those two articulate. Now interestingly, the fibula is the other bone in this trilogy, but the fibula does not articulate with the femur at all. So the fibula just needs to be positioned down here, and of course you need to make sure it's from the left side. And I'll show the left designations for the tibia and fibula in the next segment. So when determining if a tibia is on the left or right side, you want to look at this structure called the malleolus. Now, in a tibia, it's called the medial malleolus. That should tell you that this structure needs to be on the medial aspect of the body. And in this case, it is. So this is the subject's left leg, his left foot. And you can see that that malleolus is indeed pointing medially on this subject. On your own body, you can palpate the medial malleolus by just noticing the um, that larger inner bump on the uh, side of the leg. When you look at the fibula, the fibula has a structure called the lateral malleolus. And when you look at it in this position, you can see that the top side here is quite flat, but there is a little bit of a triangulation here coming to sort of a point. The key in determining if this is a left or a right fibula is that that point should be pointing toward the heel when you hold the fibula on the lateral aspect of the, of the subject's leg. So notice how the flat malleolus is facing outward. The tip is pointing toward the heel. And if you look right here, you can see the subject's lateral malleolus here, and that can be palpated as well. So we just talked about the positioning of the medial and the lateral malleolus of the tibia and the fibula. Now the final step is to articulate these with the talus of the foot. So what you'll find in this particular situation is kind of neat, is the, the little box that's been formed by those two malleoluses fits right onto the talus of the foot. And in this position, you can see how each malleolus forms that outward bump that we call the ankle. So make sure you're on the talus of the foot and not back too far on the calcaneus. Good. Now the, the last articulation that you need to do is a vertebrae, a rib, and uh, the sternum. And I have in front of you here three vertebrae from different regions of the vertebral column, and only one of them can articulate with the uh, the rib. Now just very briefly, to, uh, by way of reminder, a cervical vertebrae is usually a small one. It has holes in the transverse processes, and the spinous process is small and sometimes actually split or bifurcated. The thoracic vertebrae, which is the one that we'll use in this assembly, looks like a giraffe. It has a very sharp downward pointing spinous process, and it does not have those holes that you saw in the cervical vertebrae in the transverse processes. Finally, the lumbar vertebrae is usually the biggest. It has the biggest body, and it bears a little bit of a resemblance to a moose. The spinous process has a very blunt, kind of squarish shape look to it. So we're going to take away the lumbar and the cervical and leave just the thoracic vertebrae, and there are two important points to look for when trying to decide how to articulate the rib with it. A rib can be right or left. If you run your fingers along the shaft like this, one side should feel sharper than the other, and you always want the sharp side down, just like a knife. At the back end of the rib, you'll find two um, structures that you have to know. The head of the rib, and if you look here, you can see something called a tubercle. So the tubercle and the head of the rib are the two points of interest here. 
Remember that the head of the rib goes on the body. This is the body of the vertebrae. So that's one art point of articulation. And the other point of articulation is going to be the tubercle, which starts with T, goes on the transverse process, that's what these are, of the vertebrae. So when you put the head on the body and the tubercle and transverse process, you get an articulation like this. The last thing that you'll need is to have a sternum anteriorly articulating with uh, the front part of the rib.